and welcome to The Game Changers, the podcast where you'll hear from trailblazing, extraordinary women in sport. I'm Sue Anstis, a founding trustee of the Women's Sport Trust charity and the founder and CEO of Promote PR, one of Britain's leading sports PR agencies. In this episode, you'll hear from Scottish rugby legend Karen Finlay. Karen won 85 caps for Scotland and captain the side 52 times. Having gone on to be the first female coach for Scotland's women's team, she was head coach at Richmond Women for 10 seasons, winning five premiership titles. Karen now coaches at Harlequins Women and somehow manages to combine this role with her job as a chief superintendent in the Metropolitan Police. I met Karen at the Stoop in Twickenham the evening before Harlequin's first game in the Tyrrells Premiership. I began by asking her when she'd first seen women playing rugby. Yeah, I can. It was 1993 and it was really, really, it was bizarre because I'd only ever been a golfer. I'd only been really into golfing, being, a, being the, the sort of trait to the, if you were a child for the northeast of Scotland where golf courses were like ten a penny. Um, and it was at university. Um, and it was purely when through just people I was at university with said, oh, we're going off on this tour to Holland. And people that I'd graduated with who were playing then at the time for um, Richmond, um, having left Edinburgh University, where I studied, they, they went on tour to Holland, and I went along purely on a social basis. So you weren't playing? Not at all. No intention <laughs> of playing, no interest in playing. Um, and it was just really, really funny because they ended up being really short on, on the day as, as the tournament progressed and probably as the, the impact a good Dutch beer took its impact. <laughs> they then turned around and were like, we're really short, we're really short in the wing, get on the wing. <laughs> and I was like, get on the wing? So put my um, beer down, off I trotted <laughs> onto the wing back in the good old days. And what was really funny was I was like standing in loads of space in front of the ball, in front of everybody that was playing. And I was like, well, why are they not passing to me? Because I'm in loads and loads of space. And I, it had never entered my head like you, that you had to like the bat, the ball had to go backwards in order for you to go forwards. So I was quickly, very quickly rebuked. I learned an expensive lesson within a minute. And then and I was just hooked, absolutely hooked. And, and so when did you start playing properly then from university, is that? Yeah, I, so I, I actually went to university and then I was actually working for Grampian Police. So the minute I graduated, I went back up to the North East and it was actually through transferring through my police job to the Metropolitan Police Service. Oh, okay. So once I came back down to London and I really, really wanted to get more involved in it and because through my transference, um, it was obvious, I, I kind of ended up living in a house in Kew. And I found a natural home at London Scottish, which yeah. was co-sharing its ground with Richmond, obviously. But London Scottish didn't have a women's rugby team, but Richmond did. So I ended up finding a home away from home on the Scottish side, but yeah. obviously playing rugby for Richmond women, who were like really, really, really one of the top sides in English women's rugby at the time, along with the likes of Saracens and Wasps. Yeah. So it was a natural place to go, really. Excellent. And, and what was it at the time that attracted you to the game? You said, not on the wing, obviously, but... No, no, quickly. I was quickly moved from like, out in the outside channel right into the front row because of shape and build it, I think what it was was there was it was just such a, t- a sense of team and the camaraderie with people and it was a game for there was every shape and size involved in it and the women every every one of them that played because it was like women's rugby and to have the courage I think and the passion to do something different and obviously a lot of people are like why is women playing rugby it just really totally attracted me and saying, you know, it wasn't just the norm, it wasn't just the like run of the mill sport, but it had just so many great things associated with the game in terms of its values. Yeah, it's really interesting, isn't it? I know my daughters have said that wanting to play it because yeah. other people aren't playing it actually makes it quite appealing from that side. Yeah, I think I mean probably in my subconscious I did think that, but it was just it was just something different and it was just there was just so many things to it, learning technical skills, learning just just every kind of game understanding, being part of a bigger rugby club, um, and just, just a good sport. And do you remember watching much women's sport when you were young on television and growing up at uh, all? You know what, if I, was, if I was probably being honest, no. Nothing like now, the kind of coverage and profile women's sport has got in general. And, and I distinctly remember, I think for me... I think the point of difference was in 2012 at the Olympic Games through my job. And I was really fortunate to have a public order command role that was based within the Olympic Park for the entire period of the Games, which was, I mean, it just one of the most special periods of my entire policing service. And 
watching women's sport across that Olympic Games, I just think opened the gates for just inspire the next generation of female women coming through in sport. There were so many phenomenal role models, just great. And, and how old were you when you first played for Scotland? God, I would have been, well, I came out of university, what, 1990, did about three years up in Grampian, so 93, so probably about in my late 20s, early 30s, actually, when I think about it. And can you remember yeah, how, you, how you felt as you kind of ran out for your country for the first time? Oh, yeah, I mean, I was really, really privileged, and, and it was it was amazing because I was really lucky at the time because um, the Scotland forwards coach then, Mark Francis, who coached so many levels within English domestic rugby at the time and was obviously coaching up in Scotland, sort of saw the potential in me at Richmond, and for, for that I'm ever grateful with Mark because he kind of exposed me to saying, look, you could, you could really be good at this, you could really push on, and I, I think he probably recognised the kind of leadership that seemed to be ingrained in me. And, and that connection helped me sort of get into Scottish women's rugby, really, um, having, having left and become exile-based like yeah, everybody yeah. else. And were you frustrated at the time at a lack of coverage and, and funding for the women's game versus the men's game? It, it's really funny. It was, I, was speaking to the, I was speaking to somebody about this the other day because when I first started playing rugby, there was, there was about eight or nine of us were exile-based and, in essence, based between sort of... There was what, players based at Waterloo, there was people based at Worcester, there was people based at Richmond and Wasps, really, and Mickey. Our fullback was based up at Saracens. And we hired a minibus. We used to get it on a Friday evening, pile up all the exile players in it, literally stop at the motorway on our way up after we'd all done a day's job on a Friday get into Edinburgh, um, which was where we were mainly our training were based at, at Edinburgh Aki's as it then was. Get into Edinburgh about, you know, like well past midnight, one, two in the morning, and we get up for Saturday having to be fitness tested and get on with the training weekend. And we fun financed and funded all that, yeah. all that ourselves. There was no budget for women's rugby, but you just got on with it because, you know, you, you will find a way if you want yeah. to do something. And do you remember being irritated, annoyed, frustrated by it? Uh, just... Yeah, I, I think it was more... At the time was the big change when suddenly they went, we're gonna f- we're gonna finance your travel. Yeah. You would have thought we'd won the lucky lottery. <laughs> really, it was honestly so. It was it was just amazing. And but I think that was the difference because nobody took anything for granted. When things did go in the right direction, yeah. you were highly appreciative of it. Whereas I think now it's really interesting. Maybe it's an age thing. I don't know. But now. I'm I'm less tolerant now speaking about or the word lucky being associated yeah. with female athletes or isn't it lucky they've got and I'm like in 2021 mm, no no the, the, it's not about luck it's about equitability so that's really really you know that's really important that's I think really that is interesting isn't that change in attitude oh, yeah, grateful definitely. for the bits that are yeah. thrown to you yeah. before yeah. and you mentioned um, obviously that, rec- that recognition that you would uh, potentially leadership for the future so you were made uh, captain I think 2001 mm-hmm. and and how did that, that feel at the time to to oh, captain so yourself I, it was amazing I mean I came from a really great a great line of Scottish captains and to be fair I, I, I was probably prepared through the role from captain at Richmond yeah. and playing along such amazing female like leaders. I mean, Sue Dorrington, um, or hooker at Richmond, was just incredible. And she was at the forefront of the Women's World Cup when it first came into being. And she always taught me the real good values of, of what rugby was about and just friendship and trust and respect and just being... She was out, She was so ahead of her time, Sue, um, and just played with other people like Sue, Sue Ellis, um, the Welsh captain at Richmond. And just being able to learn off good leaders. So I think when when the Scotland, the opportunity to captain Scotland came along, it, it was... It was the next progression. It was the next thing for me. And, you know, I followed in the footsteps of Kim Littlejohn, who's an outstanding captain for Scotland, captained us to her first ever Grand Slam Scotland women's team, which Jill Burns, my then England captain and very good friend now, was, you know, I'll never forget the look on her face that day. It was not a happy good day for Jill. <laughs> but... Um, yeah, so I think I think it was a natural progression for myself, really. And what kind of captain were you? Would you say? Um, I think probably pretty demanding. I've, I've, I, I think I've got really high standards of myself, and I knew how hard it was for a lot of our players who were holding full time jobs down and and doing a full time training program. I don't think I'd ever asked 
anybody to do anything that I've, I was never prepared to do myself, first and foremost, and kind of lead by example. And it was a ch it was a difficult job. It's a difficult job, I think, when you're an exile-based captain, you know, because, I mean, there's no doubt about it. Scotland, like every other nation, it's a proud nation. I think if you're exile-based and you're going up there and there's the dynamic of making sure that you're trying to really build a togetherness between non exile based and exile based players, so it's a unique challenge. And and just holding down holding down a job that you're you know, that's not an easy job, it's a busy job. You can't necessarily guarantee you're gonna get off. And they were all the challenges at the time and you know, when you just compare that now, we're seeing the fact that we've got athletes that are now full time contracted athletes. It's just amazing. Amazing. And sometimes I've got I really I speak about it a lot with Gary in terms of coaching at Harlequins. We often pinch ourselves going, I never thought I'd see the day when we got to now where we are. And I and I hasten to add, you know, we're only on step two. There There's yet. a load yeah. of steps yeah, to yeah. go as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. And you were uh, captain fifty two times, I think you were captain yeah, across right. time. So yeah. how do you feel you developed in that role across that time? Do you feel you changed? I think, yeah, I, d I, d I think you definitely change. You change your experience, don't you? You get things wrong. I think if you if you reflect on yourself is in, in terms of how you lead and how effective you can be and and you just you just mature. Experience is the best thing in life, isn't it? You you just things that you look back on you think, Oh my god, what on earth was I doing there? But I think you just I'm lucky because I think my job and the the kind of leadership roles I've always kind of progressed into my job. The, the skill set of that has been really transferable across both worlds. That's been invaluable, yeah. and I've learned I've learned a lot of good hard lessons in sport that I harp on about within my day job to this day and age. Um, that I speak to my fellow peers within the police, and I say I don't know why we don't do more with sport because sport is at the it's really at the cutting edge. I think of performance. Yeah. You know, it, you don't have to just go from industry to industry. You can actually learn a really good little lessons from sport. So. I think it's probably helped me with both hats on, to be honest. Excellent. You retired after your third World Cup, so having won 85 caps for yeah. Scotland. Was that really hard to stop playing? Yeah, well, it was hard because it was, you know, rugby defines you a bit as much as your job does. And, and I think it was just that whole team sport. You've been part of such a, you know, in every World Cup cup cycle it comes along you you make memories it's not I mean the trophies are really really important it's nobody's in it not to win you know ultimately but it's that special bonds you have with people it's that memories that you make along the way about you know you, how you come back for defeats how you come back for non-selection how you come back from you know games that you just you'll play over in your mind forevermore I think mm -hmm. really that just never went the way you wanted them to go but I think it, it was the right time, and ironically, I was retiring while a lot, a lot of good peers that had come through that generation of rugby with me. I think there was about 11, 11 of us retired, which was such a significant sea change for Scotland. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think that's been rebuilding a process, a rebuilding that takes a long, long time, I think, to replace that amount of retirement and experience and nous mm -hmm. in a side. So, but it, but it was the right time for me, and I, I kind of started coaching the season before. So okay, yeah. I was already set on, I wanted to put something back into the game. And was that at Richmond you started your coaching? Yeah, Richmond. It was really good, actually, because, um, again, Mark had said, look, I, it would be a travesty if you don't, you know, you don't put something back into the game. And I was really lucky because the Women's Sports Foundation at the time were running a programme of identifying people that were coming up to that retirement transition period in their coaching and putting us through um, our coaching accreditation and qualifications. So... Um, I was really lucky to go on a programme and my level one was supported, my level two was supported and then I wanted to kind of consolidate that. Um, I think there's too much badge collection goes on within the sport as opposed to people just really learning their yeah, trade yeah. and their craft and so I was lucky to start that and really built up a good five, six, seven years of coaching at Richmond and then took on the first 15 coaching of the women's job at Richmond that was big because it, it didn't just entail one side we had three women's senior sides there so the organization of that on a weekly basis and just learning to build your team management team the environment you kind of want and the culture and yeah it was a really really successful period of coaching for me actually that's fantastic it's great to hear from the it's women in sport now isn't it the women's sport foundation that that funding oh. made the difference to get you started that is an amazing yeah, yeah, example was, oh, yeah it, I mean it made a huge difference and yeah. and I know there was other people did it at the time as well but the thing that they understood which I think the governing body necessarily didn't at the time and still to agree still to a degree doesn't is you know women were playing rugby on a Sunday 
most coaching courses were on a Sunday because yeah. guys play on a Saturday. Yeah, yeah. So they were like, well, why are we not getting women it's coaching? Really, simple really oh yeah. my God, yeah. I spend my <laughs> life saying it, there's a really simple solution to this and it's it still bef- befies me that I think, you know, can you not see what's going on here? So the, the changing of that and just getting people who were quite supportive at the time, Jeff Richards, the old England coach, he came to Richmond coaching. So it was quite nice to bounce ideas off of him. Um, Brett Taylor, I've got to say, was really, really good when he was at Richmond. He started doing a lot more inclusive of processes you know when he was teaching some of the young and developing um, academy guys coming up through the Richmond men's side yeah. he was like well we'll get um, the likes of Alice Richardson who was our standoff at the time we'll get her involved in that because actually she's one of the best kickers in the game okay. she was fantastic for our era um, and so suddenly there was a little bit of a sea change there for me yeah. but that that just it, in that decade was not happening enough did you know of other female rugby coaches at the time as you started coaching rugby? Yeah, I mean, at the time, there was, I was really... Yeah, Lisa Burgess, obviously, yeah, the Wales Bird, captain, yeah. Birdie. I was a love with Bird. Yeah, well, Birdie, <laughs> I mean, again, similar. You know, we played against each other. When we was, she was captain in Wales, I was captain in Scotland, and we've been on loads of classic Lionesses tours together, and, and when, just happy times. Oh, my God, it was. When I look now, I'm going to speak about job-defining. Um, but just those... You know, that, those the, those people have all gone into coaching yeah, women's yeah. rugby. Nikki Ponsard, she was coming out of play and she was going to be coaching. I'm pretty sure it was Saracens or Wasps, one or the other. So there was there was a load of that generation suddenly going into coaching. And then obviously what Susie Appleby, she was doing stuff. So that whole generation yeah. of player, there's quite there's quite a contribution, I think, even yeah. the game as it stands yeah. now. It's very really interesting when you... Then you stand back and think about where they are now. And in 2011, you appointed the first female coach of Scotland. So yeah. how did that feel? Yeah, that was that was really... Again, I just wanted to put back someone into Scottish women's rugby and I was really fortunate. Jo, who was the performance director up there, I'd spoken to her and I wanted to really put something back into my coaching and take it to the next level. And I felt I kind of understood the dynamic of what it's like to run careers because people were still running careers while yeah. playing for Scotland. There was no contracted athletes in that time and Scotland were heading into a period for a European qualification to try and get over the edge to to qualify for the World Cup then. So it was a massive, it was always going to be a challenge. I think it was it was a real challenge for me in terms of getting up there and, and managing my life across the Six Nations period. And yeah, it was chaotic. Um, and then you mentioned, I guess, that culture at Richmond and you were head coach there for 10 years, won five yeah. premiership titles. So yeah. what do you feel was so special about that squad at the time that had that success? I think there was a load of things. I think we had a really good a good environment. We were about striving for excellence and and an unequivocal message on that. I was quite clear about that, that we were tr- going to try as best as we could within the constraints of that, that era, I think, of being a performance rugby club. So... You know, I I I'd, I think if I think if if you were looking at a male counterpart and they'd been in that in that kind of environment for for that sort of seven ten years of coaching and they'd come away with like a fifty percent return in terms of winning championships, you'd you'd hear about it all over the newspapers. Yeah. But um, we just we bred excellence. We invested in we had a really strong third team. You know, we developed the third team coming up in the second team. The second team were really pushing on the door of the first team. Mm. That, you know, with first team, second team, any time they played each other in that kind of environment, there was massive clashes of competition and people were really, really pushing. And I think if you breed competition in a competitive environment, you will get people to really surface at the top of the game. Yeah. And so nobody could sit and say, well, I'm guaranteed to be in that first team shirt at the weekend. And equally, we tried to really breed a culture of it wasn't about who you are, it's what you do and what you stand for and how you how you contribute. And I think once you get that kind of key ingredients, yeah, awesome. I think yeah. it was, yeah, it was absolutely pivotal to the success we bred. Yeah. And obviously, as we sit here now and tomorrow you're playing Richmond here at home. How does that feel when you, you're playing them again now? Oh, I mean, I, I have only got really... You know, the, in terms of the women's section and coaching the women's section, I've only but got incredibly fond and proud memories of Richmond. I was really privileged to coach some of the players I did. They were out, some outstanding talent came through Richmond and they've gone on to bigger and greater things. And, and I'm fortunate that, you know, when I left Richmond, um, albeit, you know, people had opinions and views to offer, players that I'd coached when they first started playing rugby, you know, seven, eight, nine years down the line, like the likes of Vic Cornborough, um, and being involved in her genuine yeah, ec- development to the to the world class athlete I think Vic now is is you're you're really proud of those kind of that kind of investment in an individual and knowing that you've you fundamentally wanted to help them be the best that they can be. Yeah. So it's always odd for me playing Richmond, if I was being really candid. But 
you know, I, I want every team to be a, to be a success because that's 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 the greatness in the competition of the women's game now. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not to our advantage, I think, as people who have been invested in women's rugby and are now still invested in the game and want it to be as good as it can be to see see it being a great divide. Mm. That's not that's not what we're about. It, but it, but equally, I'm not for you know everybody's got to start catching up and investing. Yeah. It's not about ticket you know lowering standards. Yeah. It's about everybody getting on the same same bus and driving it forward. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. And have you? Was there any issues about you being a Scot in and coaching in England and where you talk oh, about being yeah. a non-exile and going yeah. back? It's quite funny, actually. I was speaking to Gary about this the other night because at the time I was coaching Scotland. Well, I was coaching Richmond and I took on the Scotland role, and um, I remember writing a conflict interest form, you know, that I had to submit to the RFU because obviously I couldn't go to all the the, the the sort of performance meetings with England coaching yeah. staff and declare a. You know, but but I think I if you, that, yeah, yeah we, had, we were open and honest about that. Yeah. But I mean, I've known, I mean, Gary, I've known Gary for a long, long time. And I think that was so funny when we both took on the co-head coach role here, because a lot of people were like, how on earth is that going to work out? You know, you're so Scottish and Gary's so English and you're so <laughs> forwards and you're so backs. But what it does, and I think what the benefits of it being is, it, you know, it was based on, I played with Helen, his his wife, who then became his, you know, I spoke at Gary's wedding. You know, pe- people didn't know that about me yeah, and Gary. Yeah. Um, but in terms of, we're very yin and yang, definitely. I'm often bad cop when he's good cop. But the main, the main thing that works for us is the philosophy and how we want to play the game is the same. And I think if you've got that, anything else then just sort of cascades off of that. But the benefit is it gives us a load of resilience at the cool head coach role, which there's a load of pressure on head coaches. And I think, you know, other things gone in life, you know, both of us have um, sadly experienced, you know, I've lost my dad in the past year and a half. Gary's tragically lost his mum. So, you know, when you need time out to go and spend it with your family, just like players do, you've got that added bit of resilience. Yeah. And that makes a huge difference, I think. People forget that it's, you know, we're human as well. as you know, It's not just the players that need a bit of TLC. How do you feel that you're a different coach now to, to when you started? Do you feel your coaching has changed significantly? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I do think it has changed significantly because I think when you want to, you start out, you, you, it's like every in life when you get a new job and things. I think you think, oh my God, they're all looking at me for the answer. Oh my God, I've got to come up with the answer. I've got to know all the detail. You just mature, you settle, you... You, you just learn that actually you don't need to know these things and it's actually a huge bit of coaching I think is about is, is about managing people and, and creating the best environment for them to flourish I think that's your real responsibility as a head coach and it's also understanding them as people and I think that's one thing I definitely know I, I within my job that you know we're so people it's all about people policing ultimately and I think that bringing that into coaching is really important and I think the other thing is you just I look back now and I we've got such an player empowered environment at Harlequins you know there's nothing I'm going to teach Emily Scott about being a standoff or Rachel Burford about playing you know centre they are highly proficient in their area there's discussions on a weekly basis Abby, Abby Scott you know the current England second row you know massive contribution to our line out and actually at the end of the day you're steering the ship mm. you're making sure we stay on course but some of the places that we might want to stop off at absolutely should be player led because when the whistle goes and for the next 80 minutes the influence you have on what is going to happen is negligible and you're delusional if you think it's any different it's a Jim Greenwood philosophy it's like, as well isn't it? It, it it is you just you know you've got to rely on creating that environment and sitting back and actually you're never finished learning as a coach but you become a lot more chilled out about that you become a lot more accepting of that and you're like, that's okay. That, that doesn't mean to say you're still not a good coach yeah. or you're still not driving things in the right direction or that there's a, a, a reduced respect for what you're doing. But I think it's just like everyone else. You just you grow older and you grow bigger yeah. into it, don't you? We get wiser. And obviously now, a coach, you've talked about uh, here at Harlequins Women, big Tyrrell's Premier's 15 seasons ahead. How hard have you found it to ensure, you talked about that culture in the team, but you're signing new players. So to yeah. create that culture in that team, yeah. how, how tough has that been? Well, I mean, people forget that this is like our fourth season. We're a brand new rugby club. Yeah. You know, the first season was a real challenge. We'd amalgamate bits. Of Aylesford made a really, I think, sensible, progressive decision. And so I had, saw, it was, saw what was coming over the horizon and, and sort of seized an opportunity to align themselves and, kind of take some control of their own destiny in their own hands. We had players that came with me, definitely, because for just continuity and coaching. 
and then we'd, we'd, we'd a whole raft of new players came under yeah. the banner of Harlequins. So our first season was, was almost like trying to settle some kind of rugby club. Mm. We never knew what we were doing. And, <laughs> and to be fair, there was a lot of, you know, I suppose a, there wasn't much gamble because I think the, the excitement was about creating a new rugby yeah, club yeah. and a new future for women's rugby yeah, yeah. and being able to do it differently. And the big difference for ourselves was that we absolutely had 100% buy-in from the club in the board and right at the top, David Ellis was just, and, and, and the rest of the board, Charles um, Gillings here, the owners of the club, David, all these people are just so behind women's integration and women's sport and this being a really integral part of the club. So year one was about building a rugby club. Year two was about suddenly, yeah, you can have two squads. We were like, oh my God, right? We've got to go and, <laughs> go and develop Fine. another squad. Year three was last year and I think that was probably a little bit of stability for us. But this year, I think, is really exciting for us because we feel like we're now kicking on. You know, we, we had an amazing... It was like a Leicester City football club year one where we won, won the title and we won the cup, the competition that was running. Year two and three, we've narrowly lost finals to Saracens yeah. and they're kind of painful. Like, you know, they're scarred, definitely. But you, we've probably learned a lot more about ourselves with that two losses yeah. than probably two wins. So there's a real buzz about the place this year um, with the new faces we've brought in. We needed more depth um, in certain positions and the recruitment has been really focused and targeted around that. And fantastic that what we see here at Queen's yeah. in terms of that support for the female game. Do you feel other men's clubs should be doing more of the same? Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think there's a complete... I mean, I speak about this at work a lot when we speak about diversity and, and inclusion and... Of course there's a business model. Of course there's a business reason, without a shadow of a doubt. And you'd be really naive if you didn't look at the demographic change that's going on within the, within within London yeah. and at national level to know that actually pretty soon, waking up and smell the coffee, there is going to be a huge swing. There's not going to be a 50-50 split in population dynamic. There's going to be more women wanting to come into sport. Yeah. So you'd be naive if you didn't realise there was some business case for doing that. But for me it's a moral and ethical right thing to be doing. I mean, why in the 21st century is sport not inclusive? Why are we even speaking about women's sport? We should be speaking about sport. The clubs should be at the forefront of wanting to say, you know what, this is the right thing to do because we want our stadiums full of families. We want people to be coming to watch women's sport and seeing more people in the shops buying Harlequin's kit and Harlequin's products and then coming and developing our fan base because actually the game is good and it's good to watch it's exciting to watch and everybody that I talked to it's really ironic through the last Women's World Cup the amount of people I would go into and they'd be like boss we saw we saw the Women's World Cup oh my god what an amazing game of rugby funny that we'll come and watch it on a weekly basis <laughs> yeah. you'll probably see still an amazing amount of their you know games of women's rugby but I think we, we've turned that corner now and it's gonna it's only gonna get bigger excellent and is there much we can learn do you think of oh, we uh, rugby can learn from what's happened with football and the women's world cup and WSL I know that you've been working a little bit I think with um Birmingham City women's yeah we did yeah. we've yeah we've we've gone and we've looked at we've really been lucky because we've lo- we've gone to other disciplines mm-hmm. and seen well what are you doing with your athletes program and Birmingham City City, we've they've come in as a football huge big you know setup for the women's football team up there and came in and what to see what we're doing we've exchanged ideas and it, it's really interesting because as well as they've got females on contracts they necessarily and they got the environment right that we've got you know and so the sharing experience has been really really useful I think it'll be interesting to see what happens going forwards. Yeah, watch your space. Just jumping, I guess, back a little bit. You talked about joining the Met in 93, so you've been 26 yeah. years in the, in the Met now. Why the police force for you, do you think? Um, it was, again, completely, probably a bit unintended, apart from like in policey programmes when I was really little. But um, <laughs> I went to university actually to do law, and then I found myself being more prone. I was like, oh, I quite like modern history and politics. And so... It just happened to be the opportunity within further education at that time in Scotland that you could go and do an MA and then go and do a fast track LLB, which was a law degree on top of your MA. And that was the intended plan. And when I came out of that, I actually, to be fair, nearly joined Northumbria on the graduate entry scheme. I went down for an interview at Northumbria at the same time as getting an offer from Grampian Police. So I was playing my double, I was like poker face, yeah, yeah. playing my double deck of cards. <laughs> and... Um, Northumbria probably was the closest place just south of the border, to be fair. But I had such a good experience then up in Grampy and I was just really fortunate to have a really probably progressive inspector at the time. His name was Harry Ord and he just... He, I just I've just been really lucky. I've always had somebody 
in life that is suddenly come in at various points, whether it be career or just life, that said, well, what's stopping you doing that? And I think that kind of influence, that kind of critical role model figure that you maybe even at the time don't understand as a role model, and that sort of critical friend and poke in your conscience, he sort of said, why don't you go, and, why don't you go to London? What's the worst that can possibly happen? And so I boshed off the law degree. I joined Grampian Police and then, then obviously transferred to Metropolitan Police Service. And you're now one of the most senior women in, in Met yeah, Police? I mean, it, yeah, I, I'm, I mean, I've got a phenomenal command job in the task force, which I'm exceptionally privileged and proud to have because it's, it, I just work with such an incredible amount of professional and brave staff who go every day wanting to do the best they can for Londoners. What is your day-to-day? So uh, the task force has got all, it includes all the toys, as everybody would say, it's a specialist uniformed asset for London. So it consists of the Territorial Support Group, which is our, um, our real top tier of public order officers. So in the event of the wheel coming off, as I would say, or real serious protest, disturbance, disorder in London and at national levels, people press the red button and the TSG always turn up and save the day. Yeah. We've got the Marine, which is responsible for the policing of the Thames and the estuaries yeah. and support to national Marine counterparts um, 24-7 across London. It's like the M25, it's yeah. just waterborne and all the challenges that brings. I've got Mounted, who do a phenomenal amount of incredible work around Again, big old football matches, protests, demonstrations, yeah. events across London, as well as everything that she nice that people think is ceremonial. We're all weddings yeah. and big things in the mall, but it's actually every day they do the queen, you know, the guards change yeah. on the mall, etc. But that's that's to do with kind of terrorist. It's mm. not them trotting about in a horse in the middle of London, school, yeah. looking looking <laughs> lovely. As everybody says, they always go, "What a great job!" Little do they know what goes with it. Yeah. And then dogs, every kind of conceivable dog across London, from the dogs that support frontline policing in terms of catching baddies and burglars and people who run off etc from us down to you know dog capability that uh, explosive dogs that you'll see at the airports as you run through that or train stations to you know dogs that can find cash that can find every conceivable kind of you know bodily fluid bodies underwater just amazing skill set and obviously yeah just massively helps everybody across the map Oh, it's an extraordinary role. And how do you manage? How do you manage to juggle those two, yeah. you know, ex- huge roles? I just—it's really funny because sometimes I don't know myself. If I was being brutally honest, I've become incredibly proficient at changing in about three changes from a suit to a uniform to a tracksuit okay, on the train. Yeah. It's like it's like a ba- <laughs> like it's Mr. Like, ben. It's like Mr. Ben. Honest <laughs> to God, yeah, it's just ridiculous. I mean, last night I turned up at training. I was like, "Has anybody got trainers?" Because I'd managed to pack my kit and uh, I didn't have any trainers with me. So um, the girls are pretty good at, at coming up with to help me. I assume the Met must have been supportive to the enable Met you. The Met have been incredible yeah. with me. I mean, I think if you work hard mm-hmm. when you are there. You know, when I was playing rugby, I, I was afforded special leave to play for um, Scotland and get off. And, and people that I worked with really tried to help me. And then when it was out of rugby season, I, re- you know, kind of, it was reciprocated yeah, yeah. that and said, if you guys want to go on holiday, I'll do you do your night yeah. duty then or I'll do your late turn. And I think if you work hard, people will work hard with you. But I've, I guess in turn, then, you know, you repay that favour on because I'm a great believer in if we've got healthy fit officers who love their sport and we can help them do it yeah. funnily enough you will get a lot more discretionary effort back in the bag yeah. so I think I'm really lucky because I've got you know my family are really good around me they've always understood well she's not here because she's at rugby or she's off at some European tournament or if she's off doing things like that and just good people around me really and and the team you know the team at Harlequins now as it was at Richmond when I was coaching there I was always like I'm dashing, I'm on the tube, I'm going to be there, or actually, this has happened in London, I can't be there. And it's just about planning, it's just trying to get planning detail down. Yeah. If you plan for worst-case scenario, nine times out of ten, you know, you, you never get there, but at least there's a B plan in place. Yeah. So. I'm very lucky to have you here today, very happy about that. So last year, the Met celebrated 100 years of women in the force. Yeah. How does it feel for you to have a woman like Cressida Dick that's going to lead in the organisation? Oh, it, I mean, it's massively important because, you know, it sets a tone. It sets a tone for the rest of the organisation and it certainly has an impact on the culture and temperature gauges, I would say, for the organisation. And I think she's been really clear and aspirational in saying, you know, we need to get to a 50-50 balance. Mm. And when the top of the pyramid is saying that, 
everybody else has got a really clear clear set of messaging to deliver. I think we've got some great role models in the Met at the moment. You know, we've got Assistant Commissioners, Helen Balls up there. We've got a few commanders now, and we've got a good few Chief Superintendents. And there's a real dark drive to get this right. And it does make a huge difference. And it, and it, and it comes with you. And I think we've, we've all got a responsibility to be pushing that forward. And I'm, I'm lucky I've got my SLT at work as 50-50% male women balance, and it makes a difference. Okay. Our thought processes, our considerations, the way we lead, the way, the, the, you know, just the things we ask our people, it all starts feeling like it's in a better place. So I think as senior women role models within the organisation, we have an absolute responsibility to um, be inspiring the next generation yeah. coming through. I was going to ask you that, because I do feel there's a sense of duty that you have to be that Absolutely. spokesperson for women and equality and parity, both through work and through sport too. Yeah, I think, I, I mean, it's it's really simple, because I think we overcomplicate these things, and I keep saying to people, if they cannot see it, why on earth do you think they would be it? You know, you have got to push for progress. And do you know what? If you were being honest about it, sometimes that is it's sometimes that ag that is almost being agitating. It's being yeah. you know, it's Making constantly noise, yeah. prodding. You have to make a bit of noise sometimes. That doesn't necessarily mean to say you've got to fall out with people. It doesn't mean to say you can forget any kind of like behaving in the proper way, but I do think you have got to nudge. You've got to keep pushing at the door and, and sometimes you've got to kick it open, to be quite honest, because some things are just absolutely wholly unacceptable yeah. and and the problem you've got is is if it's always been that way people don't necessarily nor maliciously understand the impact of their language the impact of the decisions they make around recruitment the impact of some of the criteria they set they, their approach to flexible working you know what happens when women come back having been off on maternity leave there's physical as well as mental impact and so can we be a little bit more conciliatory and can we be a little bit more affording of just thinking outside the box of course we can yeah. Because nine times out of ten, it's usually, or oh, the computer says no, or oh, the policy says no, oh, we've never done it that way, boss. And that's just nonsense. And so our responsibility, I think, is to think outside the box and challenge that because it's not acceptable. And is there a drive to get more women into the police force? And the, I guess we've talked about getting more women playing sport too, yeah. but is there a parity there in terms yeah, of... Yeah, there's that. I mean, we've launched, it was it was fantastic in the 100 years, it, rightfully so in the centenary year, that um, the commissioner set that we were going to launch the first ever female recruitment campaign in some amazing ads. And that's that's it's, it's come under the banner of the Strong Campaign. And I think at the moment, I think my aspiration would be to align that with their warrior campaign yeah, because yeah. it for me is an obvious obvious strong link yeah. because all the traits that we're looking for within our officers that teamwork that resilience that dynamism that energy that women that are prepared to take on really make decisions and be out there they do that in rugby every day yeah, so yeah. why wouldn't we come to women's rugby and women's sport wider yeah, yeah. and say come and apply to be a member of the Metropolitan Police Service because not every one of them is a full-time contracted athlete. Yeah, yeah. But as far as a great career with great career choices within it, it's the opportunity, is it's there. Yeah, they yeah. Just, but we've got to get them in the door. Yeah, so yeah, I think, sure. yeah, that's going to be my next little project, getting, getting them aligned. And, and in terms of girls today, what are the challenges that you feel some girls coming into the sport today face? I think there's there's a real good pathway now. I think if you come into it as a, a young girl, you can see identifiable role, role models, both on the playing and the coaching. Mm -hmm. And I think it's imperative that we drive more women down those pathways because they've got something that they can identify with. I think there's other things about, you know, like the Harlequins, the foundation programme here is incredible. They are, they are really opening rugby as an opportunity to young girls to play. So the more they can see of that, I think the England women's team have got a huge, huge role in their shoulders. I think they are absolute ambassadors for the sport, how they, the way that we played in the last World Cup really inspired. But I think the governing body is now a responsibility to build on that and not just leave it at the door of the rugby clubs. I think huge campaigns to drive more girls through it, a schools programme, it should become the norm that girls are playing rugby alongside their young male counterparts things like that can still make such a difference and do you feel enough is is happening in that route in terms of profile i mean no you know we can always do more mm. um the, the marketing of a women's game is massive because the game has got to be viable to have a sustainable future whereby the then contractual scenario 
spills and it cascades down to club level, which is coming. There is no, it's here. I mean, it's, you yeah. know, but I think for it to be viable, it needs a profile. In order to have a profile, we've got to be pushing on the door or on the door or the media channels. I think the Telegraph have done a phenomenally good job of running stuff on women's sport and it's continuing that. I think women in journalism have got a huge responsibility because if they're not going to push it, who is? Yeah. But equally... The bit for me and the bit we always get wrong is, and I see it within a work environment, or he for she partners within that environment are critical. Because women doing it on their own is not acceptable. It's not good enough. Because everybody's, they've got daughters, they've got mums, they've got aunties, they've got grannies. You've got to be saying, what is it you want for your daughter? Yeah. What is it you want for her to be able to access the same opportunities as your son, for example? Yeah. Because, you know, nine times out of ten, my God, they're as talented. And there's such a wealth of opportunity now with a women's sevens programme that you can yeah. go and travel the world, learn different cultures, play an amazing sport. It's the same within 15s. Excellent. And finally, so women coming through in a, in a career path now, yeah. all that you've learned over those years, what advice would you give to, to young women, almost where you were at that early stage, to get on and succeed? Funnily enough, I was speaking at a school last week and I think the thing that I, that I was trying to say to them, the only person who puts a limit on you is you. That's the first thing. The second thing is, do not sit on the fence because you've got to have that self-belief and you've got to back yourself and it's OK to challenge and it's OK to be that, have an opinion and be able to voice that opinion. Don't hide yourself in the corner is the bottom line for me. And thirdly, I just think you've got to work hard there's no cheap, easy routes in life. So if you apply yourself and you want to achieve something, you will find that path and you will find a way. And I think once you set that, and if you have a real aspiration and a desire within you to strive for that, you'll get there. Thanks to Karen for so openly sharing her fascinating, inspiring story with me. She's clearly an extraordinary woman juggling those two powerful roles. I'd love to know what you think about the Game Changers podcast. You can leave a review or give us a rating on iTunes or message me on social media at Sue Anstis. If you could spread the word about the Game Changers across your own networks too, that would be brilliant. You can find us on iTunes, Spotify and Stitcher, wherever you listen to podcasts. The Game Changers is produced by the team at What Goes On Media. Sam Walker is the executive producer with Rory Alskery on mixing and sound production. Next week, my guest on The Game Changers is Liz Nicholl, CBE, one of the most powerful figures in British sport. Liz has been CEO of UK Sport for the last nine years, overseeing Team GB's unparalleled success at London 2012 and in the Rio 2016 Olympics and Paralympics. This summer, Liz stepped down from that role after 20 years at UK Sport and is now president of the International Netball Federation. Actually going to my first games in 2000 and seeing Paralympic sport for the first time. And actually I remember sitting in the swimming pool. I was just blown away in terms of how, how amazing Paralympic sport is and, and what, what can be achieved.